Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us again. Uh, so welcome back to Next TV Series Europe. Uh, we are going to talk for the next 45 minutes about the pay TV and OTT market in Russia. Uh, so I'm really happy to welcome uh, with, uh, with us three panelists. We have uh, George Held from uh, Vion Group, who's the director digital operator. Hi, George. Um, then we have Fedor Ejov, who's the chief product officer and chief technology officer for MTS. Hi. And we also welcome with us Maria Gretschisnikova, uh, the group CEO from Star Media, who's a, uh, also Russian-based uh, production house. Um, so we will be uh, taking questions in the in the chat box. So feel free to communicate with us if you have any any questions for our panelists. We can uh, we can take them at the end of this session. Um, so yeah, I would like to start by uh, having a rough, uh, large overview of the pay TV market with uh, our three panelists. Um, I'm not sure if all our audiences are familiar with the Russian market, but it's a, it's a really huge pay TV market with uh, more than uh, 46 million households uh, addressed through traditional accesses like uh, satellite cable and IPTV. And the fastest segments uh, growing are IPTV and OTT standalone offers. Uh, so I'm happy to have with us two operators which are actually very active on the OTT strategies. Uh, so first, maybe uh, if George could uh, could tell us a little bit about the Beeline uh, TV products and uh, and what you what you offer in, in Russia. Absolutely. At first, thanks a lot for having us over. It's a great opportunity to represent Russia in this exciting forum. Um, Beeline in Russia is a part of Vion Group. Just for you to be aware of Vion, we operate in nine countries across extremely probably the fastest growing markets in the world. And obviously, television for us, very important proposition. But uh, as we are speaking with Russia community here, I would really like to stress that uh, pay TV and actually any television service in Russia is very different from television service in any other country. And I'll start with a personal example, because uh, we are running service, and all of us, we are running service across 11 time zones and across 11,000 kilometers. Trust me, no other company in the world are running services across this many territories. And uh, when you're running the service across so many territories, you have to rebroadcast uh, 11 times each TV show. So on the personal level, I can share with you to say last year when president did his New Year address to the nation, I personally watched it 11 times just to make sure every time is properly uh, broadcast. So no country in the world is has any scope, any similar to what we have here. Even if you look at United States, only five time zones. It's really simple, straightforward implementation. And obviously, because of the size which we have, the biggest challenge outside of quality content, pirates, whatever everybody else is having in the world, we actually face an absolutely different enemy. No other country in the world is facing. Our biggest enemy is a speed of light. And uh, actually, if you think about it for a second, when you broadcast something in Vladivostok, which is closer to Japan, your delay, uh, which is purely because of the signal is traveling through those 11,000 11, kilometers, is huge. So you need to do lots of additional equipment, lots of really fancy technological solutions to address it. So we're not going to be talking about any of this stuff, though it's very exciting. And we're going to be talking probably about content and all other interesting things we all like to watch, but really to understand that behind all of those glamorous latest movies and soap operas, children cartoons, whatever we bring in, it's extremely complex technical solution to deliver service at the quality across 11 time zones. And uh, Fyodor, myself, and other, other colleagues in telco industry perfectly understand it, and we are fighting it day and night. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, yeah, Fedor, I invite you to jump on this also because uh, you're you're representing also one of the, the biggest pay TV operator in the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, you're right. MTS is the biggest telecom company in Russia, obviously. And okay, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a big pleasure to be here, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even remotely. Okay. Mm. MTS uh, have had an idea to make a big media for the ages, right? 
Uh, today we have about 30 million subscribers which, who use MTS TV are uh, in like over IP TV, over cable, over satellite, etc., etc., etc. And it was quite obvious for us to make a jump and then switch to OTT. But it was a very big jump for us because it was very hard to understand what should be the best way, what should be our strategy here, how should we move forward to become a champions and uh, at least to have a chance to become a champion, right? And speaking about our strategy, I think there are two main things which we rely on. First, it's our own content. We are telecom, we are MTS, we do many things about telecoms, but today we decided to start producing and filming our own films and series. And we call it Kiona Originals. We produce and invest into films and series, and we believe this is the reason why many users are coming to us and continue coming to us and to our service every day. And we also believe in social impact entertainment because from one point which can entertain you and from other side it can help you to rethink social problem which exists in our world and our second point which we rely on it's our ecosystem mts already has like 40 plus million mobile subscribers and the million of the people they use our fixed internet lines and we have thousand retail stores around russia and of course all these things which can help us to grow and to, and to grow in OTT. But for us, it was uh, very interesting to understand and to try to understand what can be the best name for us. Should we still be MTS or should we switch to something new? And it was a very hard decision for us to jump and to start using a completely new brand name. So we introduced Q onto the market. It happened recently around April, this year. And actually, uh, there are two reasons why they decided to do this. First, MTS TV, it's a very traditional service. Many people think that MTS TV is something only about linear channels, nothing specific. You go here just for channels, etc. etc. No one expected that MTS TV can be something uh, new for as a service, right? And the second point uh, when we speak about MTS TV. It starts from MTS. So many people, they think that this is a service which we make only for MTS subscribers. But with Kion, our idea is much wider. We want to make a Kion offer it for everyone who live in Russia. Thank you very much, Fedor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting to see also that, uh, that MTS decided to go to the OTT market with a new brand, with a completely rebranded product by itself to, to, to also make a point that you were on a, on a new segment with a new offer, a new catalog mm -hmm. uh, going away from linear. Um, meanwhile, George, can you tell us a bit more maybe about Beeline, how the, the product, um, the, the OTT standalone network agnostic offer uh, cohabitates with your IPTV traditional set of box park? Ah, you're on mute, sorry. That's a very good question. If you look to my right, oh no, it's other right, yeah, this one, you're going to see something which we called DOR 1440, the digital operator 1440. And those numbers actually represent the amount of minutes a day. And the strategy which we have as Vion to make sure that our customers spend at least 1,440 minutes with us. And to do this, we need to offer them many, many services. This would be television on one side, communications, gaming, you name it. And more of those services we offer to our customers, the longer they stay with us, more they invest in us of their time and more loyal they are, uh, higher revenue and all of those positive things. So from this perspective, we clearly see that, yes, television is a very important part of this digital operator strategy, making sure customers spend 30, 45 minutes a day with us on consumption of television products, and it doesn't matter which screen they're using. And when we specifically looked at the television proposition, we carefully thought what can be our differentiation in the market, how we can offer something absolutely unique. And uh, put on the side this discussion on the how we deliver media. We can deliver media through IPTV, through OTT, doesn't matter. Those are technical solutions. 
for consumer, it doesn't matter. He is consuming content on his telephone, his television, whatever it is, and how it is delivered to him, it's irrelevant. But what's irrelevant to consumer, and this we strongly believe into this, are the insights, what's relevant to them. And uh, this is a normal paradox we all usually facing in tele television world in the OTT industry or IPTV, doesn't matter. <clears throat> uh, you can have 60,000 films in your catalog and gazillions of soap operas and gazillions of cartoons, but at the same time, you have nothing to watch. And to address this, we strongly believe in the recommendation engine. And we believe that strategy of our OTT or IPTV, actually of our television proposition is around recommendation engine to showcase and to recommend customer service, which he is actually relevant to him. He wants to consume at the right point of time and the right device. And uh, being a telco, we're actually in a very unique proposition, a very unique space because we know a lot about our customers. And if we are using this big data algorithms to showcase the right products to consumers in the right time, we believe this is a winning formula. Uh, sure, it's great to produce soap operas and produce movies, but it is Steven Spielberg and it is the rest. So uh, we believe that let's stick with the professionals and for us to deliver something which we have absolutely unique and unique is knowledge about the customers and based on the knowledge we have about the customer, advise them, recommend, uh, envision what can be relevant to them at the right, right point of time and the right device. And this is where our strategy is on the television. So it's very strange. It's a television strategy, but it's actually not television. It's a big data-based recommendation engine strategy for television. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, focusing on on the the aggregation of content uh, mostly. Um, Maria, I wanna I wanna come to you now because you you're uh, representing not a telco but a but a content pro producer, content uh, production house, and uh, you're also launching an OTT product. Uh, you've launched it very recently. I would like to know a little bit more about uh, about this and about your strategy and uh, what is the the market you're entering looking like in terms of uh, content uh, propositions on OTT in Russia. Right. Thanks. Thank you guys for having me here today. Uh, well, uh, actually, we're not just a production company. We uh, we used to be just a production company, but now we're more like a media company, media group, uh, having quite a lot of different uh, businesses. Uh, we differentiated ourselves uh, very much. Now we produce quite a lot of content still. Uh, it's uh, our core business. Uh, we have our pay TV channels. Uh, we, as you said, just launched our OTT platform. We're the biggest aggregator uh, on YouTube in CIS. Um, and more than that, we have our antivirus company. So we are actually doing quite a lot of different things and looking at content from all possible angles. Um, so uh, getting back to OTT platform, uh, which is called Lava, uh, we just uh, we just launched it. Uh, it's a brand new baby we have. And uh, our strategy here is to give as much Russian speaking content uh, to Russian speaking audience outside CS countries. Um, it's a logical step for us just because our ca catalog is more than 6,000 hours. It's it's more than actually 7,500 7, hours. So it's a huge catalog we have. And uh, obviously that was like, getting step by step to new businesses and um, first we launched our pay tv channels um we we were using our content in uh, youtube and then we grew grew to mcn with more than 70 uh, 70 channels now and then we launched our ott platform uh again using the uh, the content we have in our catalog and then having a um, strategy to aggregate more content from other places on the market. Uh, we see it as a great potential because we have quite a lot of analytics uh, from our YouTube uh, work. We see how uh, audience watch, uh, watches um, different, um, different content we have and different genres on different uh, territories. And we can actually um, use it uh, in our new experience with Lava. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So you you mentioned uh, you mentioned using using data on on viewers on on their behaviors or their patterns. We just got a we just got a question that's related to that. That's addressed to George. Uh, are you able to recommend the content to a specific viewer, customer, setup box? If he or she, for example, is a football fan, can you show them next match that will be broadcasted? You see, it's it's a very elegant question by itself. Because uh, being a mobile operator, you know a lot about the customer. And in this particular case, it's not only about football match, but you know what is the favorite football team. And you know that if this fan actually went to UK two weeks ago and he physically participated in this particular football match. So being a telco, uh, you have so much exposure to customer information. And let's, let's it's a very important part here which you used for the good purposes, yeah? So you know a lot about the customer and based on the knowledge about the customer, you can recommend and you can suggest football match, but not just a football match, which usually a media company can suggest because on big American platform, you saw the guy was watching five football matches, but being telco, you know which country he was traveling, you know what his friends are watching. You can suggest, why won't you go and watch football match with Manchester United placed against Barcelona, which you and your buddies saw three weeks ago in uh, in Barcelona. And maybe it's a good idea for you to hope that it, this company is going to win. So you have so much opportunities to play with this. And uh, your level of recommendation, which you can deliver as a telco operator, is absolutely on a different level than what media companies can deliver. And from this perspective, this is what relevance is coming when you're showing the right thing in the right time in the right device and the rest how you position it how you deliver the message is a level of creativity of your marketing team thank you george uh Fedor, can you can you tell us a little bit what mts is doing when it comes to content delivery and uh, optimization let's say like how how far can you go to to push the right content to to the right users you know i'm totally agree with George, because actually, as a telco, of course, we have a lot of the data. And the very great thing about machine learning and big data things is that if you have a lot of data or when you have a lot of the right data and when you have an algorithm which is not that perfect, you should be able to get a much better result than any perfect algorithm with a small amount of the data. So yes, George is right. It's all these options give us a good way to find a good match of the content for the users. And secondly, and the second thing is that we have plenty of the data which give us a chance to understand who is watching us when he start our service first time. You are a new user, you just download the application, you start using it, and we already have something in knowledge about you, so we can offer something for you right from the beginning, right from the first time you start using the app. Thanks. You see, it um, was the reason why we made the reference to Steven Spielberg, because if uh -huh. you remember his movie Minority Report, this is actually in action what Steven Spielberg envisioned for us as a human race to do by 2000, I think it was 52. We, we in 2021 and we already do many things exactly at the vision of Steven Spielberg. So uh -huh. it's great to be a telco and having a great guys with the excellent content like content which uh, Maria and her colleagues can deliver, obviously Fedor now and his <laughs> colleagues also can deliver, which we can showcase at the right device and the right point of time to the consumers. And for us, this is a winning formula for this DO1440 strategy. Thank you. So you mentioned content. I, I would like to, to go to Maria now because... Um, the the big question now on the on the TV and video landscape would be: Would you rather be an aggregator or push for original production? Uh, Maria, since you you are uh, pushing your own content on your platforms, but also on third party uh, third party platforms, pay TV channels, and so on, uh, can you tell us what's what's your strategy? How is content your key differentiator? How how do you, does your strategy revolve around this? Sure. Well, thanks. I wouldn't have that chat, uh, ch you know, choose uh, to choose uh, whether to produce or whether to to work with uh, some kind of from other parties. Uh, we do both. 
uh, mm -hmm. which is more interesting, you know. Um, so we produce for, we're an independent production company. We always been, and we're, pro we're producing quite a lot of different shows for all uh, players on the market um, from TV channels to uh, platforms now, uh, which is exciting and very interesting just because, you know, it's um, such a such an interesting time we're, we're living in. Now we can produce quite a lot of different shows uh, comparing to several years before when we had like several channels on the market and that was it basically. Uh, and um, Again, uh, as a production, uh, we produce quite a lot of uh, content uh, each year, which we can then use on all our platforms, pay TV channels, and, and so on and so forth, and distribute it worldwide, as we do. Uh, on another side, uh, being aggregates on YouTube, being uh, pay TV channels and uh, acquiring content for uh, these channels gives us more um, uh, understanding of the landscape uh, of the whole market um, of all projects uh, and how they uh, perform on uh, in on YouTube, for example, or uh, in our uh, channels. And uh, for that reason, we have, for example, in our MCN, we have um, 70 channels, as I said, more than 70 now. Uh, and some of them are really niche things uh, um, specified for uh, exact audience uh, by genre, by um, some other um, understanding of uh, that particular group of uh, audience we're looking for and working for them. Um, with other channels, it's just like uh, channels like for Star Media or other uh, players we have there. Uh, with pay TV channels, we have, uh, for now, we have three channels, uh, which are different from each other. Uh, one is for a more for family uh, audience. Another one is more, uh, um, uh, it, it has more films and um, drama content. And the third one is for male audience. So we try to, you know, to, uh, uh, to focus on in each of them uh, for some particular audience and um, have uh, content for each of it. Um, so uh, the, the question was how we, uh, how we make a choice, what to acquire or produce. Well, if, you need to, if you need to make a choice between aggregating and, and uh, pushing for your, your own content. But I guess that the answer is no, then yeah, we don't need no, to. <laughs> we don't need to. We don't need to. We, we use quite a lot of content from our own and from other companies. And uh, the strategy is to use even more. So we are ready to, to get more. Okay. Uh, Feda, I would like now to, to come to you because as a pay TV operator, you used to work mostly on aggregating channels and aggregating services. And now yeah. with Kion, you're, you're moving towards... Um, producing originals and pushing for your own content. Uh, what's what's the idea behind that? Um, why why does it make sense to do that on the current OTT landscape in Russia? Okay, you know, our mission is very simple. We want a user to spend as much time with us as possible. It doesn't matter which type of the content we use. We should spend time with us, right? Very simple. <laughs> and. From our point, we are not competitors, but we are the partners with all, all other OT players who uh, who make online cinemas in Russia. Today, on our platform, we can find content from the start, a media, EVIA, via aggregation model, because we already have uh, millions of the boxes which are already placed in the households of the people, right? And many people, they use these IPTV boxes uh, as something instead of using smart TV. Today, we have a brand new one, which are based on Android TV. We have Google Assistant in Russian. We have Google Play. You can install any kind of application here. So it means there is no reason for people to switch to, to switch to smart TV mode or play TV, right? Because we already have all of these in their small boxes. And behind this, we have our own UI, main UI, which is, which is provided by Qon. And uh, people still can consume the content TV channels, we also produce TV channels. Uh, VOD content aggregated from third party, right? Like uh, Start, IVI, etc. We can consume our content which we produce and they can, can consume the content which we also uh, license directly from, uh, from the companies, right? And they do all these things via the same UI. They have the same recommendations. They have the same search. And for them, it doesn't matter to understand 
understand and to remember where should they find a new series. We just uh, open the box, push the button, say the name, and we show them. Doesn't matter. So for us, it's okay. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. I guess, George, it's uh, it's the same idea for for Beeline also because uh, you, you present the service as a super aggregator. Uh, still on mute, George, sorry. And that's why strategy of digital operator 1440 is actually the approach which we take. Mm. Further, yeah. it's a copyright, so you cannot use 1440. Okay. Uh, just, okay. just kidding. <laughs> Noted. Well, we just got an, another question also related to content. Uh, how do you see the possibilities for European content in Russia? And is there an audience? Uh, maybe Maria, if you, if you want to start with that. Sure, we have quite a lot of European content. If we're talking about uh, aggregating that, that kind of content, we I think all of the uh, of the RTT platforms in Russia, mm -hmm. they have quite a huge catalogs of uh, European uh, European series and films, definitely. Uh, so yeah, there is an audience, and we are all watching quite a lot of different shows, uh, European as well. Not not actually not just European. There uh, there are quite many from uh, Turkey, Korea, and other countries. So we're not something very, you know, focused on Russian speaking uh, and produce better, like local content. Uh, we definitely have all the uh, all the new things coming up in the world. I would I would disagree on this stuff with Maria, mm -hmm. if you allow me. Sure. So on one side, of course. Uh, like Spain, a famous Spanish phenomenal, yeah, this uh, La Casa de Papel or Squid Game and all of those things are obviously extremely popular in Russia. The trick of the day game is the that, is that data. Once again, if you look at the consumption, you say, wow, it's lots of people who are watching La Casa de Papel. But in reality, reality of life, um, we have two centers. We have something which we call the Garden Ring in Moscow, which is like Manhattan in New York City, and the Golden Triangle in St. Petersburg, which is very similar. So all the consumption of the squid games and La Casa de Papel happening in those territories. And if you're starting to go across the bigger country, um, this is where consumption of very different content is starting to play. And this is where Maria and Fedor strategy actually works a lot. So it's a huge country. Don't forget, it's 140 million people. But this is very unique location. It's center of Moscow and center of St. Petersburg, which is consuming the latest, the most advanced, the, the hippest, the coolest content it is possible. And of course, those guys have money and they pay. But you also need to think about addressing the needs for the entire nation. And in this case, La Casa de Papel doesn't, it's not really relevant across the entire entire country and that's why the local tv series local shows actually work there so it comes yeah, back the, the number the... one is local but that's why i actually uh said about the turkish content which is more popular everywhere and it's an avod model not svod so it's a bit different thing and we see it uh, in the press unfortunately quite a lot of content from turkey is pirated and uh, that's why it's very popular everywhere in russia yeah and also, please take to account one very interesting phenomenon. We have lots of migrant workers and people migrating mm -hmm. to Russia from other countries. So let's say in Moscow, St. Petersburg and Novosibirsk, there are, for example, almost five and a half million people from Uzbekistan. I just came from Georgia a couple of minutes ago. Actually, I just landed from the flight. We also operate in Georgia. And it's also a huge Georgian community and the same with the Armenian community. So for diaspora... It is very interesting to bring in a local diaspora addressed content uh, actually to the country. And this is what actually works. Uh, by the way, on, on the airplane, somebody told me a really funny joke. So allow me to say this. So people are saying that in St. Petersburg, there are more Georgian restaurants than actually in Georgia. So guys. <laughs> Well, Georgia is a pretty small country if you compare to, to a city the size of Moscow, I guess. So, well, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, Maya, you mentioned the fact that uh, yeah, um, Turkish content is very popular, but also widely uh, consumed illegally. Can you tell us a bit maybe about the, the challenges of uh, illegal streaming in, uh, in Russia since, uh, since Star Media is also working on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, in Russia, the situation with the piracy is still very 
uh, tense, but uh, it's getting better and better with every year. Um, with the Turkish content, it's a bit different thing. And um, I hope I want uh, you know, um, open some secret or something, but when we um, try to, t- to talk about this problem with the Turkish um, uh, rate holders, they said like, it's fine, it's fine. It, uh, we don't want to actually close the, the piracy because uh, it means that our content is very popular and it helps us to, uh, to sell it to other countries as well. <laughs> so the, uh, the logic is quite strange, but uh, it, it looks like they have it. So, uh, but uh, if, um, if, there is a pos- uh, if there, there is a chance to lock down all the, uh, shut down all the piracy links, uh, we actually do that. As I said, uh, Star Media has our own anti-piracy uh, company uh, called Content Scan. And for uh, this year, uh, we've been actually working very hard and um, uh, shutting down like millions of uh, illegal links. And uh, we see the, uh, how it works uh, on revenue side, because uh, it just, uh, at the same moment, it just goes up and it really helps uh, the, uh, the right holders. Now we represent quite, uh, quite um, big companies on the market. So very, uh, very happy that finally we can do something with the piracy. Again, the, the problem didn't go away, adding one. So it's like fighting uh, every day uh, with the piracy to to get some to get some you know uh, result, but it, uh, the I think the uh, this uh, this fight is worth it. So yeah, to, to protect the industry also as a whole. Yeah. Um, Fedor, since since Kion is also launching uh, original productions now, you you became a right holders. Uh, what how is the piracy uh, affecting your business model? You know, I totally agree with Barry. Because illegal streaming and piracy are not with people in Russia. But I see that the situation is getting better and better. As, well, as far as content consumption culture is growing, like and OG players are producing better and better content. So I believe that the level of the piracy will go down the same way as it happened in UK, in US, mm-hmm. and over the Europe, right? Because actually it's quite the same happened with the audio streaming. Uh, many years back, audio streaming, piracy and illegal streaming was a, it was so big in Russia. Today, I think the level of the piracy in audio is not that much. It's not a big, right? But uh, from other point, what we like, what we like more, uh, the level of the piracy of the content for us shows uh, how appealing is our content for our users. Because if pirates pay right you, it means you did something very well, right? And for example, from our side, since uh, our launch, we have seen more than uh, 155,000 illegal links to our original content. Better well, call us, um, call us, we will help. <laughs> the yeah. number will be much smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but th- there is another actually problem. Uh, we, we did a... Um, um, we did a um, recently. We uh, we made a like. We wanted to find out how many uh, audience is really actually uh, have you know can see the difference between legal service and illegal service, and the uh, mm-hmm. the number is amazing. It's just very very high. It's like fifty percent. They don't see the difference. They don't know those quite many uh, OTT platforms. Maybe they they know some of them like Peon. Uh, IVI, the the biggest players on the market, but um, they they're not sure if uh, one of the sites they uh, they're watching the uh, the the content is legal or not. So it's another thing we all need to do in the uh, on the market is uh, to uh, to to teach audience actually, yeah, to um, to explain them. What is illegal um, and uh, what is legal, yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. why they need to try to find legal links and uh, to to watch this instead of watching illegal. And why is that? So mm-hmm. it's a huge work we need to do. 
Yeah, go, go, going with that also, I think it uh, it opens the door for for um, the the place the position of Avot services in Russia because there it's uh, it's free consumption of services. Um, so, do you think that uh, people who are now consuming illegal uh, streaming uh, content would would go towards Avod and and this is a this is also um, a big big opportunity for the market that OTT platforms should jump on. But I think it's much bigger than just Avod because coming back, I'm, I'm constantly coming back about consumer insights, and it is the reason why I'm doing this one. And obviously, proper AWOD is also driven on the consumer inside. But more importantly, even on the pay TV, when you're starting to properly target and properly show right advertisement to the customers, you show to somebody who is consuming Danone, the latest Nestle product. So you're starting to understand who the customers are. Your clicks are starting to be much more valuable. And this is where your revenue streams are starting to be very important. So it's uh, not only the revenue stream which you're starting to consume from just normal showcase on the television, but showcase and proper digital advertisement. The times of this, we call it spray and pray, advertisement already passed. Yeah? Now with it, lots of consumer insights, we can show the right content to the right people, right advertisement to the right people. And this is where actually the opportunity for the new revenue streams for pay TV operators starting to really come. AVOD is great. It's a great business model, straight, plain vanilla done everywhere in the world. Everybody is doing it. It's, it's a kind of, it's a slam dunk. It's the easy stuff to do. The real cool stuff is to show when next time you showcase um, money his to somebody in center of Moscow and you know that the guy is actually driving BMW and Mercedes is sponsoring advertising you showing this car this is where the real kind of value you can add to the ecosystem and this is where you actually generate substantial money and that's why it all comes to the consumer insights mm -hmm. I, that's actually yeah related to a question we just got about how advertising in pay tv for russian service providers uh fidel maybe you want to add something from mts point of view you know in russia today i think not only kion and mts but i think all other players they think about AVOD because this is something which can be a, a kind of replacement for traditional Russian television, right? It's like mm. you go home, push the button and watch something for free. It's right the same. At MTS, we have uh, our own advertising platform, which is called MTS Marketolog. At Kion, we are playing with AVOD and it's already available for our users at selected platforms, at, at selected titles. But I think what can be really interesting for the players is to produce original titles which are initially prepared to be available under advertising model. It means there can be more options for the product placement for the next layer for the hours. It can be uh, something about how you make the whole set of the hooks inside the show, which are more suitable for traditional TV shows, etc., etc. So it means it's just this can be a good option and a good like uh, chance for OT players to do this. Mm, thank you. And um, Maria, also, um, Star Media is, uh, is monetizing content uh, on YouTube, for example, through, through an ad supported model. Uh, what, how is it working in Russia? What can you tell from, from this business model? Uh, Avod uh, works great, <laughs> George said. Uh, it's great. I mean, uh, the, uh, well, um, it's uh, definitely uh, the um, the advertising price is definitely lower than in, for example, U.S. or other markets, but it's still uh, big and uh, not so many um, OTT platforms in Russia has a VOD model, just a few of them, I think. Right, guys? Maybe you can, uh, I think, yeah. So um, uh, YouTube is still a huge uh, possibility of monetar uh, monetizing. So um, yeah, a VOD is feeling very good itself. But uh, SVOD has been growing dramatically for the, for the last two years in Russia. So we see this, uh, like, uh, I think, around 85% of uh, all the revenues gained from uh, VOD, platform, uh, VOD business was uh, on uh, ASVOD model in the uh, last year. So 
it's it's amazing. And before that, it was the the number was much smaller. So we see the um, the potential as far, and that actually shows that uh, there is a huge potential of uh, um, fighting the piracy and having more subscribers. The uh, the audience which is ready to pay for uh, great great premieres like uh, Keon, for example, uh, had like Thoder mentioned that it's all about the content. It's all about content. If he has great content, you protect it from, uh, from the piracy, you will have new subscribers coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we only have five minutes remaining for this discussion. So one thing that I would like to know from all of you is, is where you see the, the market evolving in the next few years, especially for the for the OTT platforms. Do you think there will be more fragmentation with more uh, actors coming in the in this landscape, uh, different business models being tried? Or do you think we're rather going towards consolidation as we're seeing sometimes in, the, in Western European countries? Uh, we, we've seen that already with uh, broadcasters absorbing OTT platforms or OTT platforms coming together to, to form bigger actors. Um, Maria, if you want to start. Yeah, well, uh, Russian market has around 16 uh, VOD platforms. Uh, it's not that much, but for our uh, our audience, I think that's quite a lot. That's why, um, as Spider already mentioned, uh, now uh, some of them are trying to um, um, to work together uh, and to um, to give their co uh, content, like even uh, premieres, to other platforms. Like for example, Kion um, uh, working together with Ivy, uh, Kinepoisk, and other uh, players on the market. That's fine. That that's the normal way to of uh, working now. Uh, um, I think it will be the same uh, in the next few years. Uh, this kind of uh, collaboration between platforms just to um, to minimize their risks in producing content, in monetizing content, if they just acquire, uh, because the uh, the um, uh, the fees of the content, the uh, the license yeah. fees are getting very high, and uh, those budgets are amazing, and um, and the production budgets are uh, getting very uh, very high now. So uh, definitely, those players need to somehow to. Um, well, to uh, again, minimize their risks here. And that's why I think there will be quite a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, collaborations and mm -hmm. uh, partnerships. Okay, also on co-productions, I guess. Uh, Fidel, yep. what, what do you think? You know, I personally, I personally believe that the future is about the consolidation, right? There are too, many, too much money has been put into this market during the last years in Russia. And today it's not only about the fight between platform versus the platform. Today it's about it's about fighting of the ecosystem against ecosystem. Actually, there are uh, three main ecosystems in Russia today, and I personally believe that uh, only OTT platforms which has ecosystem support should be able to survive because otherwise it will be not so easy for the smaller players. Yeah, not so easy to have enough resources to to right. live by and yeah, stand your ground. Uh, George, what's what's your take on this? Oh. You see, movie production or content production is very glamorous. It's really great to act and uh, think that you're next Steven Spielberg and your next movie going to really be next blockbuster. And it's really cool. And, you know, you go into the bar, the bar and you tell to all your friends that you're shooting this movie and everybody is jealous. This is great. All the challenge is budgets are starting to be cost increasing. Uh, revenue is much more difficult to generate and you're going back to your shareholders and they asking you to show you the money, the kind of usual question. That's why we believe there are going to be lots of people who are going to be experimenting with content, with different forms of content. We're experimenting ourselves a lot with user generating content, with the curated content in different markets outside of Russia. But uh, we strongly believe that uh, USP and the unique thing what telecom operator can bring to the table is uh, knowledge of the customer and showcasing right content from right people. That's why we strongly believe, though it's very glamorous and we all want to be next Steven Spielberg. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, we're going back to the cold rooms 
where our data scientists connecting those boxes in a cold weather and a cold temperature and figuring out the algorithms to showcase to the consumer what he wants to watch. And this is for us is the most important because at the end of the day, it is a consumer who chooses the content. It's not the content provider who is creating the next house del papel in, and hoping that it's all gonna work. It's, a, it's all about the consumer and whatever to address consumer needs, this is where the strategy should go. Thank you. So going, yeah, going back to the audience then. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, all three of you. It was a really pleasure to, to have you today for, for this discussion. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes uh, for a panel on the booming era of live OTT broadcasting hosted by Limelight Networks. Um, so thank you very much, Maria, Fedor, and George. And I hope to, to see you sometime soon in, on another discussion. Bye.